What's up everybody? Daniel here again. Today I want to continue our series on reversals. Great reversals in the Bible. I've already done two videos. If you haven't watched those, please go back and watch those because that kind of sets up what we're talking about when we talk about reversals in the Bible. Times when God seems to say one thing or do one thing, and then a little bit later in the story, the whole thing changes, and it seems as if God changes his mind. A lot of times I think how we approach scripture is this idea that just read the Bible and do what it says. But I'm not going so far as to say that these are contradictions in the Bible, but I am going to say that it's more complicated than that, that the scriptures are complex. We're told that the Bible is the living and active word of God. Of course, it's going to change over time. Our understandings are going to change. The way we approach scriptures and Bible study is going to change. And I believe that scriptures show that God changes as well. The whole Bible is the story of God interacting with mankind. It's God's story meeting our story. So we have to look at these things critically. So today I want to draw our attention to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23. And it says this, No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting, may enter the assembly of the Lord. No one of a forbidden marriage, or there's a footnote here that that could mean, or one of illegitimate birth, nor any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the tenth generation. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the tenth generation. So in Deuteronomy 23, we have these exclusions. We have these people who are not allowed into the assembly of the Lord. In other words, they're not allowed to worship at the tabernacle or later at the temple or even, in some cases, the synagogues. So what do we do with that? God seems to be putting all these exclusions, all these barriers in the path of people trying to worship him. So are these foundational commands to be set in stone for all of time? Let's look at that. Let's look at this first one. I've mentioned it before in a previous video, but I want to mention this one today again, because I think if we really understood the full implications of this, it would change the way we interact with certain people even to this day. But that's for a whole other discussion and another time. So no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. In other words, if you're a dude and you don't have the parts that really make you a dude anymore by accident or on purpose, then you cannot worship in the temple of God. You cannot be in the assembly of God's people. Interestingly enough, that word assembly is also the word for church in Greek is ekklesia, which means assembly. You can see kind of the correlation here. So in the assembly of God's people, eunuchs were not to be allowed. So if you became a eunuch, you would not be allowed into the temple. Whether you were born with a deformity, whether it was an accident, maybe a work accident, you're on the farm, something happens, oops, you can't have kids anymore. Or whether you're maybe brought into the service of a king or queen and you are made to be a eunuch on purpose. Either way, you are not allowed to enter the assembly of God's people. Period. The end. Case closed. Well, that doesn't seem very fair, does it? Until you flip over to Isaiah 56, which says this, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. So which is it? Are eunuchs excluded from the assembly of God's people? Or are they going to be given a memorial and a name and a place of honor within the temple itself? God seems to change between Deuteronomy and Isaiah. And we see this come to fulfillment, as I've mentioned again in a previous video, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip is led by the Spirit to interact with a eunuch from Ethiopia who's going back home from Jerusalem. He starts in Isaiah 53. Philip asks, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch says, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And from that point, Philip preached Jesus to him. He taught the gospel to him. And as they're traveling along, they come by some water. And the eunuch says, here's some water. What's keeping me from being baptized? 
because at every point in, this, in his journey toward Jerusalem, I'm sure there were roadblocks in his way. There were barriers to his coming close to God. And so now he's traveling along and wonders the same thing. Okay, you've told me all this good news, but what else is there? What are you leaving out? What's keeping me? Is it the fact that I don't have my, all my masculine parts about me? Is that it? Is that going to keep me from being baptized? To which Philip says, if you believe, you're going to be baptized. And they are. And this eunuch is forever immortalized in the scriptures and given a place of honor and prominence among our stories of the Christian faith. So that's the first exclusion in Deuteronomy that is reversed in scripture. Let's go on. No one born of a forbidden marriage or, like we said earlier, one of illegitimate birth, nor any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the 10th generation. All right, this one gets a little sketchy because this applied to Jesus. Think about it. God comes to Mary, sends an angel to her, says, you're going to give birth to a baby son born of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be God's own son. And sure enough, she gets pregnant out of wedlock. Joseph marries her anyway, but the scandal is out. People know. People know what's happening. Jesus himself was an illegitimate child in the eyes of many of the leaders in his day. In fact, there's this one interaction where Jesus is talking with some of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they spout back to him, yeah, well, at least we know who our daddy is. Ooh, shots fired. Ouch. They were indicating that Jesus was nothing but a bastard child, that he was an illegitimate child, that he was not Joseph's child. He was only the son of Mary and some other guy that they don't know. And that was a scandal that followed Jesus, that followed Mary, that probably followed Joseph for years and years to come, for decades to come. Because of this, no one born of a forbidden marriage or an illegitimate birth, nor any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the 10th generation. Interestingly enough, not just does this apply to Jesus, but in some ways it would apply to Solomon, the one who built the temple itself. David had his affair with Bathsheba, had her husband killed. The child that they conceived together would later die, but then David married Bathsheba and had another son by her named Solomon, who would later become king, who would then build the temple. So what gives Deuteronomy? What are you talking about when nobody ever forbidden marriage or an illegitimate child can enter the assembly of the Lord? When it was really Solomon, who was the child of a sketchy marriage and scandalous marriage to begin with, who built the temple in the first place. Do you see why I take issue with some of these things? And then lastly, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the 10th generation. So we've got these other groups of people. I'm going to set aside the Ammonites for a second. I want to focus on the Moabites for now. The Moabites are descendants of Lot's family. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Lot and his family had settled in the region of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember that story. And they fled. Lot and his two daughters and his wife fled from Sodom and Gomorrah right before God destroyed it. But his wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. This was a crazy story that happens. Well, it gets even worse. Just a little bit after that, they're on their own. And Lot's daughters get Lot drunk in order to have children by him. Y'all, this is in the Bible. This belongs on Jerry Springer, but it's in the Bible. Jerry Springer is not a thing anymore. That's, man, I feel old. Anyway, so they do. They conceive children beat by their father, who they got drunk. And one of the children is named Moab. And it's from his line that came the Moabites. And so there's this whole issue there with um, with whether the Moabites were going to help out the people of Israel and the Hebrews when they were coming into the land. And they didn't. And there was a squabble and everything. And they did not get along. So there's this prohibition of Moabites entering this, the temple of the Lord, the assembly of God's people. To the 10th generation, mind you. To the 10th generation. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, let's trace the lineage. The people of Israel under Joshua come to the city of Jericho. See last week's video. They march around it. They do exactly what God says. And the city of Jericho is destroyed. 
Everybody in it dies except for Rahab and her family. Rahab was the, town, the city prostitute who helped out the Hebrew spies and hid them and then sent them on their way. And so she was rewarded by being saved through the destruction. So Rahab now enters into the, the people of the Hebrews and she marries a man named Solomon. And Salmon and Rahab have a child named Boaz. Boaz ends up marrying a girl named Ruth. Ruth was from Moab. She was a Moabite. Boaz marries Ruth. Ruth should not have been in the assembly of God's people, but she was brought in. Not only that, Boaz and Ruth have a child named Obed. Obed has a child named Jesse, and Jesse has a child named David. So David is a direct descendant of a Moabite to the third generation. David technically would have fallen under this exclusion. A descendant of a Moabite to the 10th generation. That includes David. That even includes Solomon, who, like we just said, built the temple in the first place. So Solomon not only was the product of a forbidden marriage, he was also a descendant of a Moabite within that 10 generation time frame. And yet he's the one who built the temple. More than that, Ruth was in the lineage of Jesus himself. You've got these scandals that are littered through the lineage of Jesus. If you read through Matthew's account as he opens his gospel, you've got uh, Tamar, you've got R Rahab, you've got Ruth, you've got Bathsheba. It is littered with scandalous women. And then Mary herself, and that whole scandal, that whole issue. So here in Deuteronomy, you've got these prohibitions against people excluding them from the assembly of God based on their sexual abnormality, based on their birth, their, who their parents are, and based on their ethnicity. And time and time again throughout the Bible, we see exceptions. And it's almost to the point where it's like, well, if there's so many exceptions, notable exceptions, notable changes, then why was it even in there in the first place? That's an answer that I don't have. I don't know why that's in there in the first place, other than to say that the book of Deuteronomy might not have been written at the same time as the rest of the Torah. That the book of Deuteronomy seems to have come to the form we have it now much, much later. The book of Deuteronomy could have been the scroll that was discovered by Josiah when he was doing the temple renovations. Or it could have been composed, compiled, edited during the exile and not really applied to anything until after the Babylonian exile when they came back. We're just not sure. I do know that Ezra, who was the main scribe and editor of a lot of Israel's history, he was pretty hard and fast about keeping the purity of the people of Israel, about not marrying foreigners, not having foreigners in the assembly. So maybe this was kind of brought over from that mindset, we're not 100% sure. But what I do know is that whenever there's a law excluding someone, there is a correlating example of that law being broken. There are exceptions to the commands, especially when it comes to excluding people from God's assembly. I think we in the church should take note of that. We should do the hard work too to sit back and think, who have we been excluding? Who have we been excluding or mistreating or oppressing or kind of pushing to the margins based on one or two commands in all of Scripture? Because what's, what's said once or twice in Scripture does not, I think, make a universal rule for all people of all times in all cultures. I think we need to do the hard work of really discovering what God intends, how God acts, what God expects from his people, and then making decisions from there. But to just sit back and say, well, the Bible says it, that settles it for me, is lazy. You have to do the hard work of diving into the scriptures and really understanding what's going on. If you found this video helpful and insightful, if you like this series, Go ahead and make sure you give it a thumbs up, subscribe,
click the notifications, do all the YouTube stuff. It'll really help out this channel and getting this word out and getting this message out that I think more and more Christians need to hear. That what we think is hard and fast, set in stone for all eternity, might not be so.